Our Father, eternal God, before the world began, you loved us and redeemed us to yourself through Jesus Christ. You have given us exceeding great and precious promises, and we worship and praise and adore thee because thou art the God who cannot fail. We thank thee that Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, has promised to be with us wherever two or three are gathered together in his name. We meet now in his name, asking the blessing, the protection, the guidance of God, the Holy Spirit, and that you will take the information and the word of God and touch the hearts and minds and souls of people, that they may see the Lord Jesus Christ, that in everything he may have the preeminence. This we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. I do not think it's possible to study today the various problems which face the Christian church without coming into contact with the eternal contemporary, the challenges of science, the challenge of philosophy, the challenge of modern theology, and of the world of the cults and the occult. And one of these great areas which has stimulated tremendous interest is the world of extraterrestrial phenomena or, if you will, the flying saucers and the allegedly little green men who occupy them. If you listen to your television set, you are going from time to time to be exposed to programs which discuss the possibility of intergalactial travel and extraterrestrial life. ABC and CBS have already gotten into this field in considerable detail. Also, if you peruse the newsstands, I think you will see that the climate is one of interest in these various things. One of the things which particularly interests me in my own analysis of this field is the fact that there seems to be a very distinct linkage between the subject of extraterrestrial travel and beings and the world of the occult, the hidden, the mysterious the secret things which God has forbidden man to become interested in. And as we go through the various sources and we see the bookstores having pulp books by the score on the subject of extra extraterrestrial life, and we see people writing on the subject, lecturing on the subject, all types of material coming out on this subject, not only in the world of religion, but particularly in the world of secular interest, we have to become interested if we consider ourselves up-to-date Christians. Now, foremost among those who have pioneered in the so-called world of the extraterrestrial is Erich von Daniken, a German who has spent considerable time writing his three major books, The Chariots of the Gods, Gods from Outer Space, and Gold of the Gods, and a fourth one soon to be released, have to this date sold more than 30 million copies, which means that people are reading Mr. Van Daniken and his theories, and he is influencing a considerable background of study in the United States and abroad. These books are being translated, I might add, and circulated throughout the world. There are others who have gotten into this field who have spoken on the subject of the gods, from Outer Space, Was God an Astronaut, and all other types of publications of this particular nature or strain. We would have to spend at least 45 or 50 minutes, which we don't have, just going through the books and the articles and the material and the tapes which have been released in this particular field. So obviously we have to confine ourselves to one, what one might call the head honcho or the, uh, if I may use this phrase, the Clifford Irving of the cosmos. <laughs> and that would be Eric Van Daniken. I'd like to claim originality for that statement, but I can't do it. Uh, People magazine did an interview with Mr. Van Daniken. Playboy magazine did an interview with him. And he has been described in various terms, one of them being the Clifford Irving of the cosmos. But whatever it is, Mr. Van Daniken has advanced some interesting theories, provocative theories, and they have to be examined, analyzed, and from a Christian perspective, answered. That is what we intend to do. Now, what is Mr. Van Daniken talking about? 
What is the theory behind Chariot of the Gods, Gods from Outer Space, and the Gold of the Gods? What is Mr. Van Daniken trying to sell as extraterrestrial revelation? Well, let's listen to the outline that he himself gives. He discusses the various aspects of extraterrestrial life and projects the idea that at one time there was an enormous intergalactic battle I'm quoting him now. And two great forces came together in the galaxies. The losers fled and ended in our particular galaxy and on our planet, Earth. They knew that they would be pursued by those who had defeated them. And so they set a trap on the fifth planet, which was between Mars and Jupiter at the time. This sent out radio waves and seemed to indicate that they had gone to that planet, when in reality they had come to Earth. On the Earth, they tunneled underground and using technology far advanced that even to our minds today and to minds apparently thousands of years ahead of ours even now, they created a vast tunnel system under Earth and a civilization on the Earth. These individuals waited for their pursuers to come, hiding and hoping that they would not be detected. The pursuers arrived, picked up the trap and the decoy, and annihilated the fifth planet. The result, of course, was some minor disturbances on Earth. There was a shift a few degrees in the Earth's axis, and this also brought about what is known in the Bible as the Noahic flood. Now they emerged from their tunnels. The winners had left and gone back to whatever galaxy they lived in, and these astronauts from outer space had sexual relations with the apes and uh, produced what is known today as Homo sapien through a developed evolutionary process which was speeded up. We are not told how it was speeded up, but we are told that it was speeded up. And finally, man was created in their image and in their likeness. Now, beyond this, they were a brutal race of individuals. And after they had created man in their own image and speeded up the evolutionary uh, growth, they proceeded to terrorize their creations. Thus, men became afraid of, quote, the gods, close quote. And the whole idea of fear of God or the gods in the Bible and in the religions of the world stems from the brutalizing effect of these creatures from outer space. Mr. Van Daniken maintains that the Bible supports extraterrestrial intervention, and he makes mention of the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by an atomic bomb, that Moses used a ray gun to defeat the Amalekites, that the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible was actually a sophisticated radio transmitter through which Moses kept in contact with the spaceship that was orbiting Earth. Ezekiel saw these marvelous spaceships and wrote about them in Ezekiel chapter 10. They were actually spaceships described in contemporary language. And finally... A new religion was born on the earth, the product of the astronauts and the apes ended up worshipping this race of beings. And all of this has been handed down to us through history and of course distorted due to circumstances and culture, time and place until we have it spread out in all of the revelations that men supposedly receive. And got from supernatural sources. Now, in a nutshell, this is the summation of Mr. Van Daniken's theory. And he sees extraterrestrial intervention in everything. One of the most amusing things pointed out by People magazine was Mr. Van Daniken's assumption that since the banana appeared on our planet and doesn't have seeds and propagates itself as other plants do, that the only possible explanation for the banana is that it arrived with these beings from outer space. 
and therefore the bananas of the gods, or the gods went bananas, <laughs> could possibly be cited as a future chapter for one of Mr. Von Daniken's excursions into the world of mythology. Now, a theory, and that's what we've been hearing, is defined quite properly as a beautiful idea ganged up on by a brutal bunch of facts. And the only way that you can really deal with Eric Van Daniken or with anybody writing in the world of the theoretical is to try and match up the facts with the theory. And once you've done that, you should have a pretty clear picture as to whether or not you are dealing with factual data or with hallucinations. And for us to do that, we have to examine in detail the things that Mr. Van Daniken has said. Now, I have a compilation, a long list, more than four dozen of Mr. Van Daniken's deviation from facts, and we will touch on some of those in just a few moments. But I would like to state in analyzing Van Daniken that there is no evidence whatsoever from the fields of archaeology, history, science, or theology that supports anything Mr. Van Daniken has said in this theory. It is purely a concept put forth to explain conditions and phenomena after one has rejected divine revelation. And Mr. Van Daniken has a tremendously developed sense of imagination. In going through the material on his, uh, in his various books, I've noticed something else that uh, I think is worthwhile pointing out. I noticed that Newsweek magazine, in discussing Van Daniken, says that the climate in which we live is one in which individuals appear to be, quote, looking for new gods to worship, close quote. And all around us, books such as Gods and Spacemen in the Ancient West, Temple of the Stars, and We Are Not the First, indicate that people are reaching out, trying to find some kind of reality, because they have turned away from the authority of the Word of God and have gone into the world of the cults and the occult. I think I can say that Mr. Van Daniken's entire system fits the outline of cults as they have developed in the United States over the last 140 years. And we are dealing with the cult of the gods from outer space, a cult that is trying to explain what we see here by taking what it wants out of the Bible and then proceeding to ignore the major thrust of biblical theology. Now, I think one of the things that's fascinating is a statement made by Dr. Carl Zagan, director of research at Cornell University, when he got on to the subject of Mr. Van Daniken and his monkeys and the various other things which he has said. Dr. Zagan says that Mr. Van Daniken's books should be used everywhere as an introductory course on the subject of logic because they contain virtually every error that one will ever find in the field of logic. So when studying logic, he recommends that Van Daniken be used as supplementary textual material. The outstanding example of how to commit every logical fallacy and every logical error is found in Mr. Van Daniken's three books. I find this to be tremendously interesting because there are so many people today who pay no attention at all to the subject of logic or how to analyze what is going on in the world around us. Dr. Carl Zagan has done us a great favor. He has pointed out that Mr. Van Daniken is a total stranger to the world of logic. And because of this, it's interesting to start analyzing what Mr. Van Daniken's critics in the field of history, in the field of science, in the field of theology, have to say, particularly the world of archaeology. 
Because it's one thing to set forth a theory. It's quite another to establish its validity. He himself has said that science must inevitably prove or disprove what he is saying. But while he is telling this to us, he describes scholars as virtual tricksters in the gold of the gods, and he says that proof will not be found by existing methods of archaeological research. So if scholars are tricksters, and if proof is not going to be found by the existing methods of archaeological research, how is anybody going to find out anything about what Mr. Van Daniken says? He sets forth a theory and then in effect states, the theory is true because I say it's true. And if you say, what about history? What about logic? What about archaeology? What about science? Mr. Van Daniken's reply immediately is that he is further advanced than all of his critics. In People magazine, in fact, he pointedly stated that he was far advanced beyond his critics. Therefore, it was virtually impossible to criticize what he was doing. Now, I think if you stop for a moment and think about it, you'll see what an impossible task has been set before us. We are given a detailed theory of what happened. We are told the Bible partially supports it. We have assertions which are supposed to be extraterrestrial in nature found in the Bible. And then we are told that the Bible is essentially unreliable and that it is not the Word of God at all. But nevertheless, what is taken out of the Bible by Mr. Van Daniken must be believed as Mr. Van Daniken interprets it. When we make an appeal to scholarship, Van Daniken says, the scholars are involved in playing tricks. When we appeal to archaeology, there is no method in contemporary archaeology that can refute what I am saying. So how does one really approach the subject? I have decided, after reading a tremendous amount of material on it, talking with people who have spent a great deal of time trying to analyze it, and hopefully trying to see whether or not it has any objective validity, that the critics deserve their day in court just as Mr. Van Daniken deserves his. So listen for a moment, if you will, to the scholars, to the critics, to the people who have examined him in their own fields, the archaeologists, the historians, the people who have made it their business to look at the facts. I quote Dr. Clifford Wilson, archaeologist, an authority in psycholinguistics, and honored as an outstanding educator in America in 1971. Quote, Time and again, Van Daniken does not validate his arguments. Conclusions and opinions are built upon suppositions which cannot be convincingly supported by the normal demands of evidence. Close quote. Dr. Frederick Giles, professor of physics, quote, he accepts conjectures as facts and builds his theories on them according to his own presuppositions. He deliberately uses the unconnected, makes it appear connected, and then presents his theories as, quote, foregone conclusions, close quote. Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, specialist in ancient history, professor of history at Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. His ideas are, quote, incredibly wild speculations without any factual basis. His statements about Egyptian history and ancient history in general show an ignorance of even the most elementary facts. His misapplication of Mesopotamian evidence, quote, borders on madness, close quote. Dr. Carl Zagon, quote, absolutely dreadful. The only thing worse than Van Daniken was the ABC documentary which had, quote, every conceivable error. Close quote. Dr. Herbert Alexander, professor of archaeology, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. That as far as archaeology is concerned, almost nothing in Van Daniken's book is factually correct. Close quote. Linguists, scientists, historians, archaeologists doubt Van Daniken's scholarship as well as his interpretation of fact and theory. 
The big question that must be faced is what is Van Daniken trying to prove? Strangely enough, the answer is bound up in the world of the occult. Because in The Gold of the Gods, his last book, Van Daniken gets down to business on the subject of religion. What do extraterrestrial visitations really mean? What do these things portend for us? What is man supposed to do in the light of all this evidence? Van Daniken says, Christianity has had its day. There is a great new world religion coming. And no longer will there be diversities of religious faith, but instead everyone will worship the only one true God that everybody has been trying to get to through all of the religions in all time and all space. Van Daniken says that he knows the astronaut gods were here because he saw them here. How did Mr. Van Daniken see them here? He astrally projected himself back into time and space, and there his light body is all the language of the occult, saw the astronauts arriving, saw the things that they were doing, understood these things, and then was able to record them for us today. What is astral projection? That is your light body, different from your soul, but a part of you, leaving your body and traveling vast distances, gathering information, observing things, and then coming back to your sleeping body so that when you awake, you know all of these things. You find astral projection in theosophy. You find it in spiritism. You find it in Rosicrucianism. In fact, you find it throughout the world of the cults and the occult, not accepting the world religions, including Hinduism, which is the mother of all paganism historically. What are we dealing with? We are dealing with Van Daniken's final conclusion. And his final conclusion is not that God was an astronaut and not that the gods from outer space are our concept of God, anthropomorphized or put in human form. That isn't what he's really getting at. What he's really getting at is Christianity has had it. And these visitations from outer space are proof that if one is going to find true religion, he is not going to find it in the Bible or in the Christian faith. He's going to find it in the revelations which come to us from these great extraterrestrial sources. Now, Mr. Van Daniken has told us that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by an atomic bomb that Moses used a ray gun, that Ezekiel saw flying saucers, the Ark of the Covenant was a radio transmitter, and that a new religion is on the horizon. He claims that cave drawings, unanswered questions such as the pyramids, the great blocks of stone on Easter Island, and additional material all prove that extraterrestrial forces were here and that the Bible is in harmony with these things. The Christian must therefore turn to the Scriptures to weigh what Mr. Van Daniken says. Did man originate by a forced evolutionary pattern from the apes who had intercourse with intergalactic beings, extraterrestrial visitors? Does the Bible support Mr. Van Daniken in this revelation? No. The record of the Scripture is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In the image of God made he him. This is a long way from Mr. Van Daniken's theory. It is the concept of a personal entity, a living God, creating man in his own spiritual image. Mr. Van Daniken says that Moses used a ray gun that Sodom and Gomorrah were annihilated by an atomic bomb. Where's the evidence for these amazing statements? Moses had a ray gun. Where in the text do we find anything like this? He was utterly paralyzed with fright. 
because a rod of wood in his hand turned into a snake. What would he ever have done with Mr. Van Daniken's souped-up spaceships, radio transmitters, and, obviously, Star Trek's phaser weapons? If he was having trouble with a rod, imagine the problems he would have had with advanced technology. Where's the evidence that these things took place? No evidence whatsoever. Just Mr. Van Daniken's statement, that is what really happened. But in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we find the Bible saying that Jehovah reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and sulfur from Jehovah out of heaven. And the Lord says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. How can you even begin to build a house for a being such as this? Did Mr. Van Daniken have any support for these ideas in Scripture? None whatsoever. Yet, he makes his appeal to the Bible. The Ark of the Covenant was a two-way radio transmitter. And Ezekiel actually saw spaceships. Now, a book has been written by a NASA scientist called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. It has some solid observations from a scientific perspective but it suffers from the same error of Mr. Van Daniken. It is assuming what it is attempting to prove. It is involved in circular reasoning. And it doesn't explain what Ezekiel saw in the context of Ezekiel. It explains it in the context of the 20th century. That is a very poor way to attempt to interpret Scripture. To go back with the tools of today and with the cultural advances and technology of today, and try and read into a passage what the individual never saw, never understood, and in fact what the passage itself doesn't say. There are no spaceships in Ezekiel. There are no spaceships anywhere in the Bible. There are no ray guns. There are no atomic bombs. There aren't even Model A Fords. And yet we are being told all of these things are grounded some way or other, very vaguely to be sure, in alleged authority of Scripture. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mr. Van Daniken talks about God. Who is the God of the Bible? The God of the Bible is a personal being. He reveals himself as God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the the Holy Spirit. Mr. Van Daniken does not accept this. He does not accept Jesus Christ as the Savior. He does not believe in His sacrifice for our sins. He goes to great difficulty to tell us that. Yet we are asked to believe that the Bible which teaches these things and is contradicted by Mr. Van Daniken is supporting his theories. Is astral projection biblical? Where in the Bible did anybody ever go on a trip in their light body? Where is one ever even mentioned? We have a difficult enough time with the one that we're carrying around with us now without inventing an imaginary one and then sending it on trips. There are people, I believe, who think they have left their bodies. I think some of them were tripped out on drugs. I think some of them hallucinated. And I think others were deceived by the occultic forces of darkness into thinking they went through what they never went through. One person asked me not too long ago in a lecture series, isn't there anything at all in the Bible that resembles astral projection? And I said, no, there isn't. But there is something in the Bible that gives us an illustration of how the devil could do it. And the person was very disappointed because the devil wasn't even in the conversation up until that point. And I said, would you look at Luke chapter 4? And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil. And Satan took him up to a high mountain. And the Bible says, in a moment of time showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glories of them. Now, how did he manage that? He couldn't take Jesus all over the world to all the kingdoms simultaneously. 
He obviously had the power to create in front of Christ a picture of what all the kingdoms of the world had to offer and all the glory and the power and the benefits connected with them. And he did it at a point in time and space on a mountaintop in Israel. If he did it for Jesus to tempt him to disobey God, you had better believe he has the power to do it to anybody he wants to, to deceive them. And can you imagine what it would do to a person leaning toward the occult to suddenly see a vision of some place and someone and then to find out that it was actually true? Why, they would believe without a question of a doubt that they had actually left their bodies and gone there. Astral projection is the product of satanic manipulation of our senses. And if drugs can change our perspective, how much more Satan, who appeals to and drugs frequently, the senses of man's mind, so that he may lead us to eternal spiritual death. Mr. Van Daniken claims he confirms what he says by astral projection, and the Bible stamps astral projection as satanic and occultic. So what are you getting? You are getting the testimony of a dabbler in the world of the occult, that the Bible is false, and that what he is telling us must be accepted as truth. Now, there are quite a number of things that could be pointed out about Mr. Van Daniken's interpretation of the Bible. The fall of man, or original sin, he tells us, was actually the result of man having sexual relations with animals. This will no doubt come as a great shock to the Roman Catholic Church and to the Eastern Orthodox communions who have been for years trumpeting and putting great emphasis upon the doctrine of original sin, which was man rebelling against his Creator in the Garden of Eden and eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which God had forbidden. In the book of Genesis, in fact, in the entire Bible, there doesn't appear one shred of evidence that male intercourse with animals ever produced the original sin or that it was the original sin. This is purely fantasy and comes under the heading of how not to interpret the Bible. We are told that man was created by artificial breeding and mutation. Genesis chapter 1 says it was in God's image. We are told that spaceships arrived on earth in Ezekiel. In Psalm 104, verses 3 and 4, we are told that it's a landing of a spaceship. I'm sure the psalmist would undoubtedly have been thrilled to have Mr. Van Daniken interpret that passage for him, since spaceships were unknown and the passage has nothing whatsoever to do with extraterrestrial life. Angels are supposed to have saved Lot, according to Genesis, from the people in Sodom who wished to destroy him and others. Mr. Van Daniken doesn't read history too well. He maintains that these angels were actually robots and that they were controlled by extraterrestrial beings. Now, it would be possible to give you about ten pages of terribly boring material on what supposedly happened when extraterrestrial beings entered this world. But I will spare you this from Mr. Van Daniken's material and simply conclude this observation by saying, all of the things he says prove the chariots of the gods, the gold of the gods, and the gods from outer space haven't proven anything where the Bible is concerned. In fact, they are totally removed from any aspect whatsoever of biblical theology. In his third book, Van Daniken, The Gold of the Gods, claims to have seen a vast underground hideaway of gold statues and documents beneath the ground in Peru and Ecuador. He says that a man named Juan Morses led him to the underground caves. Mr. Morses was interviewed, and he said, 
that he never took Van Daniken to any caves and that Van Daniken wasn't in any caves unless he was flown in the cave by a flying saucer. Mr. Van Daniken says he knows that astronauts visited the Earth because he was there. What is the evidence? He says he was there. On a lot less evidence, people have been examined by competent psychiatrists. And yet 30 million copies of this kind of thing are being found in the homes of people around the world taking seriously some of the things Mr. Van Daniken is emphasizing. The Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that at the end of the ages, Satan would arrive in the person of Antichrist and would deceive with signs and lying wonders. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, we are warned that demons will work miracles and that Antichrist will work miracles. And we are told that we are not to take at face value any explanations of anything God did. We are to expect to be deceived and put all things to the test. We're told, in fact, in 1 John chapter 4, to test everything. Test the spirits, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus Christ warned us against those who would come speaking authoritatively and quoting him. And he said, when the time of judgment comes, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Mr. Van Daniken, if he just wrote science fiction, would be a harmless lark and some interesting reading. But when he connects it with religion and then sprays it with the world of the occult, he becomes dangerous because he is attempting to meddle with the things of God and of revelation. And this is forbidden. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Ezekiel chapter 13 says, Test the prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Test those who speak out in the name of God to give you revelations. And we're told also that all manifestations of the occult are dangerous to the soul because it leads men away from the one true God into the fields of eternal spiritual darkness. Mr. Van Daniken's theories do not stand by themselves. The scientists do not back them up. The evidence does not confirm them. What we get is the great myth maker giving us more and more myths. I was doing some considerable research into the background of Mr. Van Daniken, and Playboy magazine helped me out at this juncture. Now, I don't want anybody here to think that I am a subscriber to Playboy magazine, because I am not. I do not buy the magazine, but occasionally articles come out in there which are quite revealing and helpful on contemporary subjects other than the female anatomy. And some of these can be helpful. One of these articles is an interview with Mr. Van Daniken. He was asked some interesting questions about his psychological background, about his life. And People magazine carried on the same kind of interrogation. Perhaps it would be interesting to find out what the mythmaker is really all about. Who really is the man who formulates all of these things? Well, Eric Van Daniken is a remarkable man. He rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church, of which he was a member in his youth, and was caught stealing money in a youth camp. He was convicted of fraud and sent to prison after his return from his first trip to Egypt. He was released from prison and worked in several different kinds of jobs. He would travel around the world supporting himself and gathering information for his theories. Where was Mr. Van Daniken, according to himself, when The Chariot of the Gods was published? In 1968, when the book was published, Eric Van Daniken was in prison again. This time, he was convicted of persistent fraud, embezzlement, and forgery. 
A psychiatrist labeled him a liar and a psychopath. During his three years in prison, he wrote Gods from Outer Space. Dr. Sagan says of it, they have a greater density of logical errors per page than any other book I know. Van Daniken understands almost nothing, so he ends up seeing extraterrestrial intervention everywhere. Close quote. Studying Van Daniken a little deeper was a tremendously involved job. How do you go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of theory, misstatement, and every kind of scholastic chicanery to come up with answers without boring people to death and writing books exactly the same length as he has written. That presents a tremendous challenge. I have accepted the challenge by referring to two major research works which have gone into great detail on Mr. Van Daniken. One of them is a book called Some Trust in Chariots. Another, Crash Go the Chariots. And a third source, the American paper edited in Bantam Edition, 1973. From all the pages of research by scholars, I have managed to distill the following. And I think it is of tremendous import. In Some Trust in Chariots, 16 essays appeared by specialists in various fields, all of whom decided to analyze Mr. Van Daniken. Archaeologists, physicists, historians, the scholars whose fields he had written in. I have distilled their comments on the Van Daniken theory and if astronauts really showed up from outer space. I quote, giving full credit to these men who have spent so many thousands of hours in research in their own fields. Mr. Van Daniken tells us that the structure of the Great Pyramids is granite. Apparently, he hasn't studied too carefully on the subject because the structure blocks of the Great Pyramid are limestone. There is a difference between limestone and granite. One is soft and the other is hard. Mr. Van Daniken doesn't believe that the Egyptians could have built the pyramids, therefore they must have been constructed by extraterrestrial astronauts. He cites the fact that the blocks were too heavy for ropes to pull. How could they have had the engineering know-how, the techniques to accomplish this? Obviously, he never, ever visited the Cairo Museum or any other of the source material areas that give this kind of information. The rope which Van Daniken does not believe exists is seen in the Cairo Museum and in a couple of others. The non-existent rollers, grains and huts, are also well attested in each one of these areas. The ancient Egyptians did import wood from at least nine different countries. Mr. Van Daniken says they didn't. The Sumerian gods were represented in anthropomorphic form. Mr. Van Daniken says they were not. He states that the area of the base of the pyramid of Cheops, divided by twice its height, gives the perfect geometric pi. Unfortunately, it doesn't. In fact, he doesn't even have the height of the pyramid right. He says it's 490 feet high. He never measured it because it's 481.4 feet high, which would throw off the calculations a little bit from the individuals who are supposed to have such an advanced technology. He says the stone blocks of the pyramid were joined to a thousandth of an inch. All he had to do was go there with a ruler, and he would have known they weren't joined there to the thousandth of an inch. But these kind of statements are constantly made in the Van Daniken books. He says granite was not cut and used, but it was in the early Egyptian dynasties. And he says that Mars possessed an advanced civilization 
and that Phobos is an artificial satellite of Mars. This comes as a great shock to the astronomers and to all the people that have ever studied Mars, which he has never studied, because they maintain, quote, there is not a shred of evidence that Mars ever had any civilization, much less advanced civilization. Phobos is not an artificial satellite. One of the interesting things about how Van Daniken writes is you find quotations like this. Everything is, quote, possible and credible, close quote. And then a little while later, some things are, quote, incredible and preposterous, close quote. But if you don't read all the book, you never run into the contradiction. Jonathan Swift is cited by Van Daniken and is supposed to have given precise data about Mars' two moons. Jonathan Swift does not give precise data. In fact, he's off by a very large factor. In quoting Einstein's theory of relativity in one place to support his theory, Van Daniken undermines his theory in another place. Emmanuel Vilikovsky claimed that Venus came from Jupiter, not Mars. Van Daniken contradicts him. One of the things that interests me in reading all these books, I don't know whether it struck your mind, but personally it did mine, if these gods from outer space were so tremendously advanced technologically over us and so terribly smart, how is it that all of the technology we see in the supposed drawings on the cave walls and all of the things which are supposed to be so advanced look like everything that we've got now and we are not advanced? We are just entering the space age. I would think that somebody that arrived intergalactically with aircraft of that type thousands of years ago would certainly look a little bit different than we do as far as dress is concerned and certainly would have a technology far advanced. He's also a great linguist. He says, elephantinos in Greek means elephant. If you check any Greek lexicon, you'll find that it means ivory. There is a difference between the elephant's body and the ivory that comes out on the elephant's tusks. But Mr. Van Daniken does not know this. He tells us that the Egyptians learned their mummification technique from the astronauts who came from outer space. They taught the Egyptians how to embalm bodies and, for that matter, how, in effect, to raise the dead. We find no evidence of any of these things anywhere. And the fascinating thing about it is Mr. Van Daniken cannot read Egyptian hieroglyphics, knows nothing about what's on the walls, and therefore cannot give a thorough analysis of what is going on. I think John Weldon beautifully summed it up this way in a little footnote when he said, Van Daniken has treated evidence as independent when it isn't. Stated manuscripts are new when they aren't. Combines separate sources without saying so. And does not deal fairly with accepted contrary opinion as to the nature of his sources. His poor scholarship, quote, discredits all that he has to say about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now I have five or ten pages of the scholars contradicting Mr. Van Daniken. He sees on cave walls and on pyramids spacemen. But the tall statues on top of the pyramid, which Van Daniken calls spacemen, now listen to this carefully, are in reality wearing feathered headdresses, not space helmets, protective breastplates worn in war, not advanced units, and the communication devices are, are atlatls or spear throwers. These are the experts reading the walls. Mr. Van Daniken says, here are the spacemen. The experts say, here are the savages dressed up for battle. Now we're also told that great blocks of granite or rock on Easter Island had to be moved around by forces that the Easter Islanders never had. He never checked it very thoroughly because the people out there have records of how they moved the blocks by ropes, and pulleys and rollers. So it's no mystery to see these big blocks on Easter Island 
because the people who live there know where they came from and what they are. And furthermore, that they move them, not the gods from outer space. You also have an overall diagram shot in the CBS and the ABC documentaries of the great runways where the spaceships landed from outer space. Now, we know for a fact that sophisticated, very sophisticated form of landings are not done at enormous speeds from intergalactial type of transportation, but instead the ideal landing is to come down and to fire rockets in reverse thrust to land. And some of those runways are miles long, supposed runways, miles long, which indicates that if they were spaceships, they didn't have any brakes. And who in his right mind would travel vast distances over galaxies without brakes? But that, of course, is passed off and no one pays much attention to it whatsoever. Mr. Van Daniken dives into the Aztec cultures. He dives into the Mayan culture. He dives into the Mexican culture. And he drowns in every single one of them. Because the experts who write in the fields say, Mr. Van Daniken doesn't know anything about Mexican culture. Quote, the Toltec god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, is earlier in origin than the Mayan god Kukulkan. And the accounts of Quetzalcoatl are Toltec, not Mayan. The Mayan describes only Kukulkan. But Mr. Van Daniken doesn't know that because he's never had a course in it. So he just puts the reverse information and people read it and say, my, how scholarly. It's amazing how you can be deceived simply by sources you don't know. And Mr. Van Daniken's books are filled with distortions of sources. The Mayan art Van Daniken uses to show an astronaut at the controls of his rocket has several flaws, if this is the true interpretation. What is the Quetzal bird doing perched on the nose cone of the rocket? What is the skull with fangs doing beneath the astronaut's seat? Possibly his mother-in-law. <laughs> Why is the astronaut sticking his head out the window? Rockets don't have them. Fourth, why is he improperly clothed for space travel? Answer, in reality, a Mayan dignitary is seated on a throne over the skull of the Lord of the Earth and is ready to pick fruit from the Tree of Life, on top of which is a sacred bird representing the zenith direction. Close quote. That's what it means. But Mr. Van Daniken has a full-blown spaceship with an astronaut at the controls ready to take off skull and all. The representations of winged gods in Egypt are obviously bird wings, not rocket wings if Mr. Van Daniken had taken the trouble to examine it. And the evidence he gives to support the Sumerian flood, says one archaeologist, over the biblical flood disproves his own argument and establishes the validity of the biblical record. Now, what is all of this to mean in terms of the Christian analysis? It can mean only this. We are being asked to accept what neither science, history, nor archaeology gives us any evidence to support. We are being asked to accept theory in place of divine revelation which has been validated in numerous places, whereas Mr. Van Daniken is validated no place but in Mr. Van Daniken's memory. From the point of view of the Mesopotamian evidence, we are told, the land of the Bible, this book is so full of error, misstatement, and untruth as to be worthless. Close quote. The blocks of the Cheops pyramid are only two and a half tons. They are not 12 tons, as Mr. Van Daniken says. And modern engineers could build a copy of the pyramids without any trouble whatsoever. They wouldn't need the advanced technology of this civilization from beyond the stars. The inaccuracies in the books are summed up in this one paragraph. Quote, Van Daniken's work is inaccurate, 
It distorts the facts. It ignores known facts of Aztec civilization. It is careless and irresponsible. Yet, in Gods from Outer Space, Bantam Book, 1974, Roman numeral 8, von Daniken is described as, quote, completely free of all prejudices, close quote. He attacks Jesus Christ as the Savior, the personality of the God of the Bible, the credibility and authority of the Scriptures. He mangles the Old Testament by misinterpretation and by eisegesis reading into it what it obviously does not say. And as Dr. C.F. Gold sums it up, quote, Chariot of the Gods is a book in praise of visionaries, of daring speculation, and of fantastic theories. It supports these not because they are true, but because, quote, all things are possible, close quote. It condemns as narrow-minded and reactionary those who on other grounds reject the visions which take so much courage to present, close quote. I think I would sum up Mr. Van Daniken and what we are seeing in his books in one succinct sentence. Regardless of the impact he has had, Van Daniken has not one bit of evidence to back up his major thesis. And the Christian has no business accepting occultic testimony as proof of what God has forbidden man to penetrate. We have a great opportunity. That opportunity is to show to people who are involved in this type of thinking that at the root is the world, the weird world, if you will, of the occult. An impersonal God, astral projection, past and present, reincarnation, and a new religion, a one world amalgamation of everybody else and everything else in order to try and bring some semblance of congruity to a theory which has no value whatsoever scientifically, historically, archaeologically, or theologically. The Christian church had better remember that it is people like Van Daniken who are ignored that have in the past caused so many problems in evangelism. For people will find others quoting Van Daniken and these sources as proof that it is not necessary to believe in the revelation of Holy Scripture. The Christian church can take but one position in the face of all this, and that is the position that God has taken in His Word. Put it to the test. We have. It is incorrect theologically. It is incorrect scientifically. It is incorrect logically. It is a travesty on solid reason. And it is dangerous because it clothes half-truths in the glossy veneer of attractive technology. And people, without thinking, commit themselves to the implications that when fully realized are occultic, and destructive to the soul. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. And if a man rise up and speak religiously, and that's exactly what he's done, then if he speak not according to the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in him. Eric Van Daniken has no spiritual light in him. And the world of the occult will use what he has written to back up its advanced so-called theories of human development. May God give us the grace and the wisdom and the courage to speak out against these things factually and to love the people who are trapped by them so that we may take the time and the effort to present them with the true gospel and the salvation which God has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Our Father, bless thy word. May it touch each one of our hearts and convey to us the great need 
of standing firm in the liberty wherein Christ has set us free. Help us not to be entangled by all the things of earth, but to set our affection on the things which are above where Christ dwells at the right hand of God. Deliver us and mankind from the awful darkness of the occult and from the dangers of Van Daniken and those who walk in the precarious pathways of deception and spiritual death. In Jesus Christ's name, with thanksgiving, amen.